Hi, and welcome back to the WellBe Show and podcast. My name is Adrienne Nolan Smith, and I am so, so excited to have Mark Bertolini with me today. Mark, welcome. Hi, Adrienne. Mark is the former CEO of Aetna, one of the largest health insurance companies in the world, until about two years ago when he sold the company to CVS. Um, he is currently a retiree, enjoying life, and uh, as I read on your bio, I think on Twitter, a rabid hockey fan. Yep. Uh, my husband is also a rabid hockey fan for the New York Islanders, which is a very sad losing franchise forever. Um, so I've watched many <laughs> the islanders it's the worst i think the last time they won he was born that year so <laughs> it's just very sad well, i know the feeling so i'm really a detroit red wings fan because i grew up in detroit that's what i and, thought because i knew you were from michigan and so i'm a i'm a ranger fan until the red wings show up and then oh okay my terry sawchuck um jersey on and i'm in i'm in madison square garden getting yelled at um Okay, I was because some, you know, Michigan fans or, or Midwestern hockey fans, as I know a lot from from my business school friends that um, they don't they won't have a secondary team like they'll just find the, the bar to watch the Red Wings or whatever. So um, it's very open minded of you to to embrace the Rangers as your second team. My wife, Mari, grew up with the Rangers. So I have you know, you have to you have to make some. Sort oh, of yes. There we go. Yeah, there. I knew there was something else to it. <laughs> I would love to talk about a million things because you're such a dynamic person with tons of interests, but I'm most excited to talk to you about your experience running Aetna and also your personal health experiences because when I first heard you talk about them in an interview, um, it really just struck me because so much of integrative medicine, functional medicine, holistic, and all these different terms for it, but basically just you know, trying to heal root causes of health issues with as natural an approach as possible has largely been, you know, frustrated for years with um, not getting things covered or feeling like the health insurance system was set up for the medical industrial complex or the the conventional healthcare system, whatever you want to call it, and and makes it very challenging to get that kind of care. And yet, you were you know, actively uh, learning about it, believing in it, using it. Um, and I just thought that was so interesting. So first of all, I know you had a very serious accident that put you into a coma, almost killed you, as well as a son who was given a deadly cancer diagnosis. So can you share about those experiences and how they led you to be a proponent of a more holistic uh, approach to healing? Yeah, I, I think um, the dawning realization was <clears throat> not so much during the episode um, or during the hospitalization. So when I was in the hospital with a broken neck um, and I had terrible neuropathic pain, I was just wondering if I was going to get out of the hospital. Um, same thing with my son. When he was diagnosed with T-cell gamma delta lymphoma, um, you know, it was, is he going to survive? So it's sort of the immediate reptilian brain kicks in um, that says, you am I going to make it out of this? But once you get out and you realize that what they fixed was the acute event and didn't really prepare you to somehow gather what remained of your life together um, and to move forward, I realized that how disconnected the system was, how solely focused it was, a, it was focused on acute issues um, and that those acute issues once solved really didn't put you back in a place where you could live your life to the fullest extent. Um, you had to figure that out yourself. And so I went on this search first for Eric and then for me around, okay, how do I find a place that eliminates the barriers that my present condition presents in the life I wanted to lead? Um, and that, that was sort of the dawning moment is that we as humans don't describe ourselves as I'm a spinal cord injury patient or my son's a cancer survivor. He never describes himself that way. He's got huge immunology issues because he's you know, still on drugs um, for his cure. I have huge pain issues as a result of my injury. And I look at all the things that I used to do, like playing the piano. I was um, you know, trained in, in, as a pianist um, or riding my motorcycles or riding my bike or playing golf or fly fishing as things that are harder and in some cases impossible for me to do because of my injury. And I want to solve that problem 
not my injury. I can't fix that. It is what it is, but I want to solve that problem. And nobody's around to help you figure that out but yourself. My whole platform and my work is dedicated to, I, I say, empowering people in their health and making sure that, you know, by by the end of their experience, reading my content, listening to the podcast, you know, working with me one on one or taking any of my programs as a patient advocate, that they are themselves a CEO of their health and that they don't need a patient advocate um, because they are so empowered and they might not have all the resources and tools, but they understand how to find them and, and what needs to happen. Um, so I, I very much appreciate that. Um, but it's amazing. You had a long career in the health insurance world before these experiences. Um, did you utilize any, you know, holistic medicine or natural therapies at all before that? No. And I can remember, um, sitting in my son's room on the day that he got his infusion of bone marrow from my brother, one of my brothers. Um, it was Good Friday and a person came in who did Reiki. And she said, would you like Reiki? And he said, sure, I'll try anything. Cause he was you know, obviously very stressed going through this. He'd been through total body radiation for the week before. Um, and he had it and he said, wow, that, that was great. And she said, well, would you like to try? I said, sure, because you know, I was literally living in his room with him at the time. And, and um, she started doing Reiki on me and it drove me crazy because she wouldn't touch me. It was sort of like she was waving her hands over me. I found it annoying, quite frankly, and said, you, know, you can stop now, it's not working for me. Um, no, I had, I had used TM, Transcendental Meditation in college, but I largely did that because I was working full time going to school full time and partying full time. And to fit all that in, you needed to find some restorative mechanism that allowed you to be alert um, um, you know, 20, 20 hours a day. Um, so TM gave me that opportunity, but literally Reiki was the first thing I tried since then. And I found it um, annoying. And I sort of put it on the back shelf until I was trying to solve a year after my accident when I was on seven different narcotic medications to control my pain and not feeling any better, it was either kill myself or find a way out. And it was in that journey of finding my way out that I discovered complementary medicine in a more meaningful way. Yeah, I think I read that the thing that really helped you was craniosacral therapy, um, which for anybody watching this who isn't familiar and you are probably, you know, you're more, more familiar than I am. Um, but it's also sort of a, um, very gentle manipulation that combines some energy work with also structural manipulation. Is that correct? Yeah. So there's a sheaf, a bag, if you will, that goes around your spinal cord and your brain. It's called the dural sheath. Um, and the dural sheath contains cerebral spinal fluid and that cerebral spinal fluid in healthy individuals flows back and forth in a very gentle way, like a heartbeat. Um, and when I had my injury, I pulled my nerve root. One of the things beyond breaking my neck, I pulled the nerve root from my left arm, one of the big nerve roots, C7, C8, out of my spinal cord, and it ripped my dural sheath and lost most of the use of my left arm. You can see it's a little thinner. And um, it's now functional today because I've had a lot of surgery to reconnect it, but what was happening is my cerebral spinal fluid was torquing inside my dural sheath. And when I went for craniosacral therapy, the manipulation of the head bones and the sacral bones um, allow, it starts to reestablish that flow back and forth. That's how it works. And it's very gentle manipulation um, of the brain and, and, and sacrum to allow this flow to start to continue it again. I remember somebody saying to me, well, they hold onto your head really lightly and also your sacrum really lightly and it helps you. And I'm thinking, you know, somebody's gonna hold on my head and my sacrum, I'm gonna feel better, you know, wacky, but maybe I'll try it. And, and um, after the fourth visit, I actually started coming off my meds. Um, and a year later, I was off all my meds um, as a result. And it was just reestablishing this rhythm because a lot of pain um, is around lack of sleep and anxiety, um, particularly your tolerance for pain. And a lack of sleep and anxiety arises um, from this 
noise inside your dural sheath about it not flowing gently, sort of like rocking you to sleep or keeping you calm. And so the reptile brain takes over um, and your pain spikes because you got the flight or fight response going um, and it just cycles and gets worse. This is, this is the very nature of PTSD, quite frankly. I've thought a lot about and, and watched a lot of documentaries and read about the alternative medicine or complementary integrative, whatever we want to call it, um, movement within the VA and within the U.S. military and was able to interview a doctor within the military. And they're just the combination of the opioid crisis and the effectiveness they're seeing with using some of, especially acupuncture, but a couple of other ones as well, um, on these vets and soldiers who were on like you, 10, 15 mm -hmm. different narcotics forever and just kind of feeling so trapped and depressed because of it, very suicidal as well, and uh, eventually being able to come off of these. So the sort of the psychosomatic aspect of pain, I think is only just like, we're just lifting the veil on it, but I think it'll be just commonplace knowledge, I hopefully in, I don't know, a couple decades or something um, as we learn. Lucky more. for me, I'm not addicted to, I, I, I don't have an addictive physiology to, to, to uh, opioids. Um, I proved that when, you know, because I was on fentanyl and Dilaudid and Oxycontin and all these drugs at the same Neurontin, Keppra, and all these drugs at the same time, Vicodin, um, and I didn't get addicted to them. I proved it then, and I proved it when I was in college when I didn't get addicted either. So, um, you know, so, it, so I was lucky. But yeah, people, very lucky. They get an injury in high school and they get put on something like Vicodin or Oxycodone and all of a sudden they're hooked. Yeah, it's, it's so it's so fragile at that age, too, because yeah. they might not even know they have an addictive personality yet. And yeah. then it just kind of it's too late. The, you had these experiences, especially your accident, which was just unbelievably traumatic. And then you came back to Aetna and were CEO and started making um, some changes. And I've heard about a few of these changes in the interview that I saw of you, but can you describe what those were and whether you got pushback, uh, anything you kind of tried to implement now that you sort of had this realization? Yeah, when I, when I got off my drugs, um, I was a person that used to run four miles every morning and I worked out every day. And, you know, part of the survival of my accident was the fact that, you know, I was in very good shape. I was 184 pounds, 8% body fat. I mean, I was really strong. And so when I got off the drugs, and I started feeling better. The next question was, well, how do I engage in activity? And um, uh, my wife suggested, well, why don't you try yoga? And I said, well, yoga is for girls. And she said, oh, really? Um, and Mari trained with Jessica Char and Krishma Sharia in India, in Madras, um, when she was in college. And, um, and, and so she took me on the journey to learn about Vinny Yoga. Um, and I met the head of the American Vinny Yoga Institute, Gary Kraftsau, because um, Mari was training as a yoga, yoga teacher there. Um, and um, we started on this discussion about what yoga really was. Um, you know, it's about connection. It's about physical poses um, and breathing connected in a way to allow you to prepare yourself to sit in meditation for an extended period of time. And in that meditation to understand um, that um, we are all connected, we are all one, and that all this noise we have in our head are about attachments. And often people don't meditate because they say it's too noisy, I'm thinking of too many things. Well, all those things you're thinking of is, is, are your attachments. And if you have a practice that allows you to recognize those thoughts, acknowledge that they're attachments and let them go, when you do that every day um, over an extended period of time, they go away and you lose your attachments. And therefore you're more present, you're more available to others um, and you find this whole pathway. So I'm going through this process with Mari and I'm reading the Upanishads and the, you know, Pratibhijna Hridayam and, and the Bhagavad Gita and I'm studying you know, all this Sanskrit stuff. And I go to work one day and I start meeting with my team. And I say, you know, we should all have our employees do meditation and yoga. And everybody, you know, sitting at the table dutifully said, sure, boss, that's a great idea. Good one. And I get into my office and like almost immediately the chief medical officer follows me in and says, you know, that's crazy. That's voodoo. 
And I said to Lonnie Reisman, his name, great doctor, great, great um, innovator, and he's an entrepreneur. Um, and we had bought his company and he came along with the company. Um, I said, what does it take Lonnie for us to prove this? Um, and he said, we need to do a double blind study. So we did this double blind study of yoga and meditation, populations on the East Coast, West Coast. Um, and I found it interesting that the West Coast people were more stressed than the East Coast people. And we looked at stress based on heart rate variability and cortisol levels, pre and post. And so, you know, 12 week program, Mari designed it, Mari taught the first classes. And like a month after the thing's done, Lonnie walks in my office and says, you won't believe this, it's like amazing. And, and what we found was that people that were in the highest quintile of stress consume $2,500 more a year in healthcare than the average employee population, which they were part of the average. Um, and that those rates of stress dropped dramatically, more than half. Um, the people in the program. And it, well, what it did is it reduced our healthcare, cost, actually reduced the amount of our healthcare costs, the dollar amount by seven and a half percent the next year, because we got these people well again. But Mari brought home some of the log, the, the, the journals for me to read. And I'm reading these journals and it's talking about people working two jobs, families that have to buy Medicaid instead of our own health plan because we charge our employees for dependents. Um, people on food stamps. And I'm going, well, the reason these people are stressed is because of me. Um, and, you know, Mario is going, oh, here you are, big shot. Um, you know, and I always swore I was never going to work for the man. And, and now I'm the man. You know, she goes, you're, hey, big shot. You know, what are you doing to help your employees? I'm teaching these classes. These people are burned out. So I asked my head of HR at the time to look at who these people were. Um, what did the frontline employees experience of life look like experience? How much should we pay them? And sure enough, you know, people on food stamps, people on Medicaid, um, people working two jobs, people returning bill collectors calls at break. Um, and you know, they were making $12, anywhere from 12 to 12 and a half dollars an hour. Um, so I started working with the team and I gave them a copy of Thomas Piketty's book capitalism in the 21st century about redistribution of wealth as a solution um, to fixing income inequality and, and people at the, you know, at the lower end of the income spectrum. And um, I said, this is the solution unless we as the captains of capitalism decide we want to make it different. And through a lot of pushing and shoving and my forbidding spreadsheets after a while, we decided we would raise minimum wage from 12 to $16 an hour. And that for employees who needed health benefits, and we're under 300% of the federal poverty level, we would wipe out their health care costs if they engaged in wellness and with our programs. And I remember flying to Jacksonville to make a big announcement. Um, people thought I was going to sell the company or something, um, or I was retiring. And I walked into the room and told them, we're going to do this for you. And it was the most amazing experience. It gets even, even gets me emotional today. It was 2015. And it was the most amazing experience. I mean, free hugs. Um, you know, people you know, in letters afterwards, where, you know, I finally can send my kids to college. I don't have to call bill collectors on break time. You know, thank you so much. And what it did is it did two things. It helped all those employees, but more profoundly, among CEOs, it changed a lot. Because they called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, if we're going to fix this problem, we can't wait for Washington to solve it because we know Washington can't work. It doesn't work. So instead of waiting as corporations to get permission from Washington, what we need to do as people, as leaders, is make the change and then turn to Washington and say, here's how you can help us make this better. Now, I'm far more disappointed in what's happened since then, quite frankly. Um, I think you know, with this last tax cut, CEOs embarrassed all CEOs like me by you know, taking the tax cuts and doing the largest share buyback in American history instead of enriching people's lives that needed it. So I'm not happy with that. And I even mentioned that in my book. But this idea gave my employees, my leadership team permission to bring more ideas. And so a whole cascade, double tuition reimbursement, repay student loans, um, create PTO banks for people, paid time off banks for people. When we don't, I didn't use mine, I put it in the PTO bank. Other people could use it if they had family hardships help our foundation helping families that were in trouble, moving our people out of harm's way during hurricanes, 
or major disasters and into hotels, including their family and their pets, um, so they would be safe. All that stuff just sort of happened. Pet therapy in all of our buildings. And the only time, and people would line up down the hall to go pet dogs and rabbits and cats and um, gerbils. I said no to many ponies. That's the only time I said no um, to many ponies. But that was, so all of a sudden it was this huge cultural shift in the company that is impossible to measure from an economic standpoint. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, you were so lucky to be able to have the measure, the measurement of the yoga and meditation study. Most places implement something like that, but don't implement the study to prove it. And it ends up getting kind of cut as soon as the budgets get a little tighter and stuff like that. So I really appreciate that you did that. And I wonder after you did that, if the company then thought, would this bring down our members' healthcare costs as well? If we covered you know, yoga and meditation apps and classes and stuff, because traditionally those things have not been covered by health insurance. Was there any conversations about that? We did. We actually offered it. We created a website called etnasocialcompact.com. Um, I wanted to call it social contract, but the attorneys didn't like that word. Um, so we called it etnasocialcompact.com. The show CEO is about how we did the analysis, the decision making, what kind of metrics we collected so they could do it themselves. And I did a lot of phone calls with CEOs and said, okay, tell me how you did that again and the kind of things you did. The issue with yoga and meditation, it was the meditation was easy because we could do that with uh, computer-based models um, for everybody. The yoga was harder because we did space um, to do it. Um, and they needed really well-trained yoga teachers to do it, um, particularly the kind of yoga we were doing. I mean, we were doing direct from India kind of yoga, stuff that goes on in these weekend classes. And so there are yoga teachers and then there are teachers. And getting the right number of yoga teachers, like from the American Vinny Yoga Institute, was hard. We didn't have enough of them around yeah. the country. So we were limited in that regard. Yeah, that's such a tricky part about, like, you know, traditionally health insurance, if you cover an MD, they all go to different schools and there's some good ones and bad ones. But generally, you know, they're, they're an MD, mm-hmm. um, whereas very cheap, I don't know, gym fitness yoga classes are completely different from, you know, the right. kind of experience that you had studying yoga. So it's like when you cover that, you don't really know the quality and therefore how that relates to the outcome. But it's great to know that you tried that. So on that topic, um, very few natural functional integrative medicine doctors um, are covered by the big insurance companies. Um, And those doctors are, you know, they usually don't even take insurance because the insurance model is just so very different from how they practice as far as these longer appointments and spending much more time with the patient and not always having an outcome like writing a script or referring to a procedure, but just, you know, learning, talking, going through their lifestyle. How do you think we can solve this problem? Because it it really is the major barrier to people accessing a more holistic approach to their healthcare, especially for people that don't have disposable income. And what do you think really needs to happen to shift the paradigm um, of holistic medicine being like this luxury, fancy, rich people thing? Yeah, I think the biggest problem we have is state-based um, licensing and regulation on uh, on, on, for, on providers. Um, a natural because I use a naturopath. Um, a naturopath in New York cannot bill um, as a provider. They can send. They can ask for cash, but they can't bill a claim, and they're not considered part of a medical provider, even though they're licensed um, in the state of New York. Um, so you have different regulations depending on where you live. And as you know, from living in the, you know, the greater New York metroplex, um, borders are, you know, all over the place. You know, you got Jersey, you got Connecticut, you got New York. And so solving that problem on a national basis and saying, here's what a licensed provider can do and cannot do, um, state, regardless of state lines, is incredibly important. It's going to become more important when you get into super specialized care where you have providers, particularly with 5G coming along, um, and I sit on the you know the rising board, with 5G coming along, remote medicine is gonna be more popular as we learned in the pandemic, right? You don't have a doctor anymore. I mean, for some things you do, but others you don't. That's one point. The second point is, is when you price all of that in, um, what are the premiums? 
But there's a point that most people don't understand that they don't think of when they go to a, go to one of these providers. We all have HSA or HRA plans, most of us, or FSA plans. All those funds can be used to pay for those providers. And it's a wallet we don't know about. Um, often we don't even know what's in there um, because it's not readily available. And, and so those, you can easily do it and you can easily do it on the spot with the cards they have now. Uh, but most I have, people don't this understand. has been my number one recommendation to people for as long as I've been doing this um, is to, you know, max out their HSAs and um, you can carry it on year after year. You can pass it on to a loved one when you die. You can invest that money. Like, I just think it's, it's fantastic. And, uh, but it only comes with, you know, high deductible health plans usually, which um, I realized. It's majority some- what we have today. <laughs> but it's right. majority of what we have today. Quite right. Sure. Yeah. But some people push back against me saying like, well, I can't afford to have a high deductible health plan. And I say, I get it. Um, and so what I wish, what I dream of, and you can tell me how unrealistic this is, is just that all of healthcare is an HSA account and there's no submitting and get re- getting reimbursed or denied or this and that. You just have the card. If it's, you know, a- if you're able to, to pay for it through the card, great. Everything goes through there. It's your money. So I think there's more accountability and responsibility as well there. Um, and there's broader uh, use across many kinds of medicine, the way that it is today with naturopathic physicians and acupuncture and things like that. So is that a pipe dream? Is that ever going to be? No, it's the- not actually, you can do that today. How? So um, on Amazon and their payment um, section, you can actually add your HSA and FSA cards. Okay. And if you do anything on Amazon that apply, that that would apply to that payment mechanism, they'll prompt you and say, do you know you can pay with this for you with your HSA card? I did not, I will be doing that tonight. Do it tonight. I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, it's, they're opening up a whole new wallet for Americans. So you can do that um, on Amazon um, today. Yeah. And I use it, you know, at a CVS or Walgreens or something, if I know that, but you know, it's very, um, this is like kind of what I do for a living. So I've looked at all of the things that are covered and I know they change year to year. And, but I think most people don't look at those lists. Like they don't realize that sunscreen is covered, but band-aids aren't, or, you know, whatever. Supplements Um, are covered. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's lots of great stuff that's covered. Massage is covered. Oh yeah. I, I, covered. I, mean, I all use mine. Covered. I use mine all the time. I use mine for supplements. Um, I use it for all kinds of things. So, um, but I also realized that, you know, that's not for it. A lot of people aren't, aren't realizing that that's an option. And so I think it's, it's about awareness and education, but it's also about hopefully getting things streamlined where that's all your healthcare, you know, you don't have to worry also about your plan and, whether you have this or that and and within it, you just use that. So anyway, I dream about that. I I, I think the relegation of insurance to the back room. So I view a world where we have the conversation about the investment, right? When you go to buy a car, you can't go to General Motors and buy a car. You can't go to GMAC, the financing arm and buy a car. They don't sell them. You have to go to the dealership and you have to describe your ambition for transportation. I want this kind of car with this kind of seats, you know, convertible or not, or I want it to be electric or whatever it is you want it to be. And once you decide it, what your investment's gonna be, what kind of ambition you have for transportation, then you say, how much does that cost? And once you figure out how it's gonna cost, then you decide how to pay for it. I'm going to do a trade-in. I'm going to borrow money. I'm going to pay cash. That's the only way to buy a car today. That's why you know buying cars has become so easy because there's no margin in cars anymore because people buy cars that way. So what if we bought healthcare that way? What if we said, my ambition for my health is to eliminate my pain so I can ride my bicycle more often, go fly fishing, and play the piano again? And if you can figure out a plan to help me do that, I want to invest in that because this is the issue around engagement. If we say to people, you're a diabetic and that the best way for you to look is like the 
cover of men's fitness or women's fitness magazine, because that's healthy. Most people throw their hands up and go, ain't going to happen for me. And you don't motivate them. But if you say to them, you know, that pedal neuropathy that you have that, what, what, what don't you like about that? Well, I can't go for a walk or I can't run or I can't walk over to the senior center to, to, to go play cards. You say, well, you know, if we get your diabetes under control, we can get those feet better. So you can do that again. Are you interested? Sure, I'll do that. And so once we figure out what that plan is, then say, okay, now how do you want to finance it? And in the back of the room, we've got Medicare, we've got Medicaid, we've got all these other commercial health plans. We'll give you a quote on all of them. You pick the one that suits you best. Yeah, and I think the, the quote on what suits you best, but also what that actually encompasses yeah. is so important. Th that stood out to me, what you just said, because um, you talked about something similar in the interview that I watched and it. I just want to call it out. So the Democrats are obviously now in charge of the White House and both houses of Congress. So I think we could see um, some major legislative changes in the next two to four years. Um, right. Medicare for all is considered one of the, you know, left solutions to lowering healthcare costs. And I know that from the interview that you said you aligned left, but I heard um, that you said about Medicare for all that refinancing this kind of broken system, which is excellent for acute care, but not really for chronic care, which is the majority of our costs is not going to solve the problem, right? It's just kind of um, moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic or something like that is the analogy I've heard. Um, so I, I agree with that. That's always made sense to me when people uh, mention that to me and ask me my thoughts on it. I say like, that's, the financing is a problem, but like way before that, way upstream is the main problem, which is right. that we're trying to, we're not looking at the root causes of these health issues and, and solving them from the bottom up. So um, what would you tell President Biden to do tomorrow from whatever he could do from a policy perspective to try to fix not only our health care costs, but, you know, maybe go a bit upstream and, and see what he can do there? What's actually happening in Medicare today and Medicare Advantage? Um, what we figured out in Medicare Advantage is that if we actually invest in the individual social determinants of health, we'll have a much greater impact on their costs. They'll have better survey scores. We'll meet all their HEDIS indicators. And the way the system's set up, our star ratings will go up and we'll get 5% more in revenue to take care of them. And so, you know, that's the model. The average Medicare person spends 120 hours in the healthcare system every year. That is less than 95% of their waking hours, or less than 5% of their, 6% of their waking hours. So for 94, 95% of our waking hours, we're in the world. And the doctor never has a clear picture of what's going on in the world because they're not connected to that. They see you in the office. And they'll say, how's the diet going? Or how's the exercise going? And they're looking at you and they know it's not going well, but you're gonna say, you know what, great. Right. And and so and they'll look at tests and they'll say we test are bad, but they'll never sit down and say, how's the stress of your life going? How's your relationships? Are you sleeping well? All those sorts of things. Very few doctors do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, in that understanding that you come up with these issues about how to better take care of someone. So I will argue that providing people with support for food, transportation, heat, um, and socialization, seniors particularly in their home, is less than two ER visits a year. That's a better investment actually. And, and so what we need to do is fix that stuff because the federal government, if it's paying for all of it, in my opinion, doesn't really matter. It doesn't fix anything. And as a matter of fact, when Medicare was started, the first financial intermediary the company that set up all the systems, all the payment mechanisms, all the eligibility systems was a company called Aetna. I had the first Medicare check on my wall in my office at Aetna for $571.17 paid to Hartford Hospital in January 1965. So the insurance industry has always run that. The insurance industry runs Medicare Advantage. The insurance industry still runs Medicare. United is one of the biggest providers of parts A through whatever F. And the insurance industry runs Medicaid. The only time it wasn't run was for the ACA. And that was a disaster coming out of the box. 
So you still need this public private partnership to make it work. So if we're just gonna refinance a broken system, then it's just gonna cost us more. And I don't know that the, the, the US government is a really good purveyor of good financing of effective efficient systems. And, and so that's, that's where the issue is. It's in that dialogue. People throw out Medicare for all, let's talk about it. You know, who, who runs the Medicare system today? Who runs the Medicaid system today? They say, well, your Medicare costs so much less to administer it. Well, who does that? Well, we do it. The industry does it. But there's only four plans. That's why it's so cheap. Yeah. So and I've, I've been told, I mean, you know a lot more about this than I do, that a lot of the, the private payer patients for health insurance companies are really making up the difference of a lot of their Medicare and Medicaid yeah. members or beneficiaries. Yeah. So. Um, it's actually the government involvement in setting those prices, which throws everybody else's prices so out of whack, which is interesting. You know, I think some government involvement is good in certain things, but it's funny when they get involved in a system that used to be a perfect market. This is just kind of nerding out a little bit with my business school hat on, but supply was the doctors and the healthcare providers. Uh, demand was the patient, consumer, whatever. It's no longer even close to that because the payer is somebody else. So people don't know what things cost. Um, they would be a lot more scrutinizing if they did up front before they committed to a new doctor or procedure or whatever. And so I don't know what the answer is because I, you know, I, I believe that health insurance is, is useful. Um, but I do know that a perfect market would get the prices more in line with what they should be. We need to have a different conversation. So what we need to say to people is when you're, when you, when you need follow-up for your care or you're worried about your health, Come and talk to us and let's have this conversation that says, what is it about your health that gets in the way of the life you want to lead? And then let's put together that plan. So you, you may be too, you remember triptychs? You may be too young for triptychs. But AAA used to make these maps for people that wanted to go on vacation. So you went to AAA and you didn't say, where do I go on vacation? You went to AAA and say, I want to go to the Grand Canyon. We're going to drive. Um, and, you know, how do I get there? And what they would do is give you these flip book of maps with a yellow highlighted route. Um, and then they would orange circle all the attractions on the, on the way, the mystery stop, um, Paul Bunyan and his ox babe and his big ax, um, the fudge stores, all that stuff. And they give you guidebooks for all of those orange circled items. And you bring it home in a bag and you put it on the table and say, here's our trip to the Grand Canyon. We're going to drive and here are all the places we can go. Where do you want to go? That was called a trip tick, trip ticket. What if we built that for healthcare? Um, where, where do you wanna go? What are we solving for here? You wanna walk to the senior center again. Okay, how do we get your diabetes under control? Here's your pathway. Here are all the things you need to know about it. And once we figure that out, let's find the cheapest possible way to pay for it. And so insurance goes to the back of the dealership, to the back of the store, where it's just used to pay it and you, and, you, and you shop for the most effective financing. And that's what insurance companies ultimately will become. Yeah, I, I believe in that. And I think for somebody like me, I, I care deeply about health freedom and being able to you know, make my own choices about the kinds of providers I'd like to see and you know, not say like, I'm gonna do this because it's covered, but just have that f flexibility and freedom. And so, you know, it makes sense for me to have a very low, you know, sort of acute emergency only yeah. type, of, you know, hit by a car type of thing. And the rest of it, like, leave it up to me. I, I, I care deeply. I research a lot. I believe I can make good decisions. So that's a very different need from somebody who really isn't empowered in their health and really isn't engaged um, and might have a lot of chronic health issues and wants to just kind of have everything taken care of by their health insurance and go through the process that way. Um, and to think that we should all have the same answer is totally incorrect. So I think your yeah. custom trip idea is, is, is good. Well, um, I think then you put doctors at their highest use and based on their skill sets. So it's, you know, cognitive skills and the laying out of hands versus, you know, where, where do we get your lab filled out? Um, you know, what pharmacy do you belong to? Um, that should be a whole other concierge system that works around it. And I think the patient-centered medical home model is a really good model um, with the doctor as a quarterback or as the big thinker versus the doctor trying to figure out which pharmacy you need to go to. 
Right. Yeah. The administrative side of healthcare is very cumbersome and putting it on the doctor who really just wants to be the care provider is it's a bad use of their skills. And also I think it really burns them out. So we're in this chronic disease epidemic, right? Um, And as you said, like the American system is pretty broken. We have the lowest health outcomes of the 34 OECD nations. Um, Life expectancy has been going down the last couple of years for the first time in I think like 40 years or something. Um, It's the most expensive system per capita in the world. And so given the stuff that you use in your own life, the, you know, naturopathic physicians, as well as all of your experience in the health insurance world, what role do you see, you know, health insurance in general playing to get us out of this chronic disease crisis? I know you mentioned a few things already about what you think um, would, would help, but, you know, just how do we go from this broken system to one that, you know, really works for people? Well, I think, I mean, one of the reasons we did the CVS deals, I think standalone insurance as a mechanism to help solve healthcare's problems is not going to work, right? It's financing yeah. a bad investment. Um, so, you know, no matter how much money you have, if you buy a bad car, it's a bad car. No matter if you got the money cheap or you saved your life for it, it's a bad car. And so, you know, we keep trying to perfume the pig here by financing the system differently. It's not going to work. That's why I think value-based contracts aren't going to work either over the long run. If you've seen one value-based contract, you've seen one value-based contract. So the issue really needs to be, let's make it about the person. Let's build the system around them. Let's support them with services in the community nearer their home. I was in the hospital in March. I got out, I needed a shower to share for a couple of days because I've been in an ICU for nine days and I couldn't stand that long. At the local DME, my shower chair was 250 bucks. On Amazon, it was 35 delivered to my door, same chair. So, but people don't do that. They don't think, well, I'll buy a shower chair from Amazon. That's a great idea. And they'll deliver it to me. Um, And so if you think about that, just the arbitrage on buying better and thinking smarter and doing things that are relative to me and my my circumstances in my home and in my community, I think there's a more robust economy around health and caregiving that could emerge where we spend more money there than we do in the medical industrial complex and building bigger and shinier buildings with more machines that go beep. Um, take, a, <laughs> take a line from, uh, from Monty Python. Yes. I, I was, my, my life before Welby was in health tech. Actually, I worked with hospitals um, and I actually worked on the DISRIP program. If you are familiar with that uh, back in uh, sort of, like you said, it was a lot of uh, social determinants for health. And I think it was a good uh, program. Um, you were a health systems planner, right? I, I mean, I just worked with, I was on the technology company side. Okay. So I worked with my hospital clients to see how our technology solutions could help them meet yeah. the district program goals, yeah. um, which a lot of which were, you know, trying to get people with chronic disease to stop coming to the hospital, you know, right. but of course there were such perverse incentives. Like they didn't, they wanted them to come on day 31 cause that was fine. Right. But not day 30, you know, I was just like, Oh my God. And so I think I got pretty, disillusioned. And also it had my own experiences. I lost my mom uh, to suicide and I had chronic Lyme disease and stuff. So I saw a lot of parts of the healthcare system. And when I got, when I, and I healed my own health issues through a natural approach and just from really understanding what was going on in my body and, you know, taking out certain foods and using herbs, I didn't understand how powerful herbs could be. It kind of changed my perspective on what we should be doing to help people with chronic conditions and and certainly the the gut brain connection and things like that and and realizing after the fact how many other health issues were under the surface for my mother but it was you know that kind of boiled up into this uh mental illness but really i mean there was thyroid there was childhood trauma there was uh parasites there was you know all this other stuff and i thought god i wish there had been somebody that gathered the pieces um, and saw, you know, peeled the onion back before she had this major manic episode, you know, because it was years and years in the making. And so that's really, you know, leaving healthcare, conventional healthcare technology and starting this was really born out of that passion to help people see uh, and bring a lot of research and statistics and brilliant minds like yourself into the fold, because I was sort of sick of hearing that it was just, you know, quackery and, and, uh, 
not science and this and that. And then in reading so much research myself and saying, well, what is that then? That's research, like that's science. That was my path. So what would you say, you know, as us consumers, us patients, what can we do to make our voices heard and advocate for this more health freedom or trying to get this more holistic medicine into the conventional system? And from your experience, even though I know that healthcare financing isn't going to lead that charge or shouldn't lead that charge. Yeah, I think first of all, you need to understand what problem you're trying to solve. And so that, you know, that requires a little personal awareness. Um, it requires introspection into what you're willing to do. As a result of all the surgeries I've had, I have limitations um, because of my, my, my broken neck. And so every time I, I stretch them and I break something else, my doctors are tired, getting tired of putting me back together. You know, I've had um, probably seven or eight surgeries in the last 14 years, um, 16 years since I had my original accident because it's the way I want to live my life. And so I always say to them, you know, I had a fractured humerus at one point from a, 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 an accident I had and uh, because I don't have good control of my left arm. And, and the doctor said to me, you know, well, you know, we're going to have to fix it. I said, well, I'm an inch short on the left side on my bright calipers because this arm is contracted. Could you give me an extra inch in the bone while you're putting the arm back together? Um, and so you have to have this sort of sense of what it is you want out of life. Um, Versus, you know, one of my first initial, you know, the things not usable all that well, I might just cut it off. Um, and, and so this whole idea, what is it, what's valuable to me as, the, as a person around my health? What about my health is getting in the way of the life I want to lead? That will then steer you toward the kind of people you should go see. I work with an integrated cardiologist who listens to my heart but doesn't make me take all my clothes off and do an exam. We have a conversation. She's amazing. Um, and we sit and talk about lifestyle, childhood. Um, you know, was I raised on a bottle or not? Um, all those sorts of things. And, and, you know, and all of that matters. And so when you have a conversation with a person like that, you're wondering, why am I doing that? And in the end, it's because it's valuable to me and people understanding who I am and what I need. You have to do that homework first and then go into the system to find the people to help you do it. Then you can look at your HSA and your benefits and say, how can I get access to um, that kind of care and afford it? You know, I think so many people look to health insurance to solve the problems instead of looking inside themselves to know what they want out of life and therefore what they want from their health. And also having a come to Jesus moment with themselves to say, I always say, uh, the hundred choices that you make a day are your true health care. Like right. How many of those 100 choices do you think actually improve your health versus detract from it? And when people can honestly say, I think most of mine are, you know, making me healthier, then they're on the path. But, you know, a lot of people just don't want to don't want to deal with it, don't want to think about it, don't want to confront their own, you know, kind of uh, lack of self-love, lack of self-compassion yep. uh, to take the time to move enough, make nourishing food, go shopping for nourishing food and, you know, places that have it, um, you know, do do those things that, you know, uh, once you care enough about your body, you'll do. But in, before that, you may not. The single biggest problem in the American public is insulin resistance. It drives inflammation. It drives heart problems. Um, it creates huge obesity. It's a driver of obesity across America. When you think about things like corn syrup and everything, um, you know, corn and everything, um, insulin resistance is a really big problem and people don't know they have it until it's often too late. It's showing up in diabetes type two. Um, and the sacrifices required to address with insulin resistance, which I have, is you know, 30 grams of carbs a day versus 180. Um, that's recommended by the average daily diet. Um, you know, not two scotches every night. Um, you know, it's, it's a different world. Um, but if I wanna have the level of acuity, activity, and enjoy the life the way I want to enjoy it, those are the sacrifices I need to make. But you never get there unless you understand what your issue is. I think the major leap of understanding what your issues are and also the life you want and how you feel about yourself, like it's all the, that, that stuff, people people just shut it off. They don't want to don't want to go there. Uh, they want someone else to deal with it usually because it can be painful, I think. Or take a pill. 
or take right, a if, I just, if I take my cholesterol lowering drug and my metformin, wow, I can just eat chips and drink all day long. So right, exactly. It's a miracle. <laughs> I'm sure there's nothing happening on the other side of that. You know, it's a miracle. <laughs> Um, actually, speaking of insulin resistance in food, I know that you were instrumental when you were at Aetna in getting the Aetna Foundation to support Wholesome Wave, which was a program yeah. that gave families um, on meal assistance and food stamps, uh, farmers market vouchers. Can you ever see a world where that's a possibility for members of health insurance companies like Aetna sure. or any others? I, again, I think s social determinant support by health plans is an important thing to do. And there's one, there's a plan out here in California in San Diego called SCAN, that is what's called a social HMO or a SHMO um, that says we'll pay for anything that makes you well and prevents you from using the system. Um, we'll cover it all, um, diapers, transportation, whatever. And those kinds of models are good models. People have to be willing to work within them and use them effectively. You need, again, you need this personal awareness self-awareness is different um, sort of mindset in order to work in that system. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. They're great models. I know how much food can act as either medicine or poison. And so I always wonder like why we aren't starting there as far as financing. If somebody is on Medicare or Medicaid or even their private insurance, you know, it, it would, they know if a, enough double blind studies are done, they'll see it saves, you know, a dramatic amount of healthcare costs in the system. Um, but it's just but so hard. At, but if you look at all the food pyramid and you look at all the recommended daily allowance for Americans, it's still too high in carbs. Oh yeah. And, and sugar and, and sugar. Yeah. And why is that? I mean, all the double blind studies in the world have been done around lowering carb intake and sugar intake. And why haven't we dealt with it? Yeah. I think it's called industry. <laughs> <laughs> I think lobbying is very powerful. Bingo. Uh, money talks. I know I've taken up a ton of your time. It's just so interesting. I could probably talk to you for six hours about all this stuff. Um, but I'll ask you one more question before I let you go. So we're in the age of COVID, right? COVID-19 yep. has shown us just how important our overall health is when it comes to our ability to combat the virus. I had COVID in November and uh, I was actually surprised how mild my experience was. Um, yeah. You know, I did have a symptom. I had a fever the first night. And after that, I just kind of had like a stuffy nose. I didn't even lose my sense of taste or smell and uh, wasn't really tired or anything. And um, it was just so dramatically different for, for me as, you know, versus other people. And uh, you hear such a spectrum. But I had been making three meals a day for myself with pretty much only organic food since March when we all were kind of, you know, quarantined or rather just, you know, living at home, working at home. And I take a lot of supplements that we now know are very important for COVID, the vitamin D and glutathione. I take regularly just as a gut health boost, but yep. it turns out that it can be for COVID treatment actually. And, and was in a New York Post article that I read, a uh, life-saving treatment for somebody who was on a respirator. But the point is, the cost difference between a healthy person getting COVID and a sick person, you know, being in the ICU for weeks or months is outrageous. I mean, it, it's just outrageous. Do you think COVID will be a sort of a wake up call or a driver um, for healthcare financing companies or insurance companies to expand coverage to these more sort of nutritional building and sort of lifestyle support things like supplements and healthy food that we know are having an impact on people's health before they get COVID and then obviously how they recover from it? No. No. Oh, darn. <laughs> and the reason is the vaccine is going to save everybody from it. And if you ever thought if you could design a bug that was particularly useful in destroying the U.S. economy, this is it. Let's introduce a bug that goes after a heavily comorbid population that has huge levels of obesity and bad habits, particularly our individual freedoms um, and no personal responsibility. And a vaccine comes along and goes, I got the vaccine. I mean, the vaccine right now, getting a vaccine, getting an appointment for a vaccine is just like getting tickets to Hamilton. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. Everybody right. that I know is just celebrating. It's like they're 
off the hook. They don't have to take care of themselves. It's like. So anything that can absolve us of personal accountability. And the problem is, is that we, all of this stuff, if you look at all of medical science and all it's done over the years, the magic bullet mentality is going to prevent us from addressing the root causes. Mm -hmm. If you look at all the medical science over time, the biggest advances have been around issues of public health, clean water, um, hand washing, um, you know, the germ theory, all those sorts of things, sewers, um, all those sorts of things. And if you look at the rest of medical science, it's actually detracted from life expectancy. Um, so, you know, I, I would argue that this dismissal of all these public health programs like mask wearing and hand washing and, you know, not, you know, social distancing in a time till we find a solution and people just rejecting it out of hand is our biggest problem. Yeah. It's real science. I don't like wearing a mask. I hate wearing a mask. Um, you know, I don't like not having to go to a restaurant and sit at a bar and have a nice drink, but you know what? I can't do it because I'm putting other people at risk or I'm putting myself at risk. And if yeah. you want to brag that you got, you know, you know, you're a tough guy and you can live through COVID. Great. Go ahead do that, but don't get anybody else sick. Yeah. You know, I've had friends who you know, have had it and said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm gonna give, how many people did you get sick while you were, while you were, while you were walking around with that disease? Yeah, no, it's that's that's definitely the scariest part, and you have no idea because every body reacts so differently uh, right. how that other person or their body will will handle it. And I think yeah. the mask wearing is just such an easy like if that helps, why why is it a big deal? I just I, it's I'm fine with it. I just wish that the public health officials today were not only saying wear your mask and social distancing, but we're also saying if you're vitamin D deficient, find out immediately get a supplement, like we right. know this matters. Or if right. you have comorbidities, you better get on a regimen and a diet ASAP to make sure that you don't end up in a hospital. But that's not what's being communicated. Well, I think we have a, a very big problem with hopelessness in this country. And that's a key driver behind people not taking care of themselves. And it's a key driver of the opioid epidemic. I'm giving up. You know, lack of labor mobility, I'm hanging with the Klan. And you know, we did this work with um, um, IDEO and understanding health front to back and reinventing the customer experience as part of our preparation for the CDS deal. And in that discussion, there was a lot of discussion with people who said, you know what, I know I'm fat. I know I got diabetes. You know, I'm retired. I just want to enjoy myself before I go. Yeah. It's a fatalism. And I think that kind of attitude really works against really taking care of ourselves. Then you have the other end of the spectrum, which is the transhumanist movement and the people in the longevity institute who want to live forever. And you know, I'm not quite sure I want to live forever. I don't know about you. No, it's, you know, I see a point where I'm going to say like, this was fun. I'm, I think I'm ready. <laughs> I want to be in great health until that, until that day. There's a great article about James Fries, F-R-I-E-S in 1972 about squaring out the morbidity curve. And, and he did a study that looked at, you know, organ reserve and at, you know, whatever medical science was at the time. And his comment was, you know, 85 is about the best you can do where your, or your, your organ systems, you know, start to fail. And so wouldn't it be great if you were perfectly healthy until the morning of your 85th birthday, had a huge breakfast and you were dead by noon? Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that's kind of around my, I say I want to live to 91 so I get to my uh, 60th wedding anniversary. That's my goal. Great. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you so much for this. I know I've kept you longer than I told you originally, and I appreciate your time. It's such an honor uh, to pick your brain and get to hear all your thoughts from all of your experiences, both personal and professional um, on healthcare, healthcare financing, what it's really gonna take to, you know, get us out of this chronic disease epidemic and really what we can do as Americans to fix this system that kind of broke around us without, a, without our consent, without us realizing it. And we wanna help our fellow people. You know, there's a lot of people who are so sick and have been for so long on so many drugs and spend so much time in these 
procedures and just in the system um, when we can see some of the stuff is most of the stuff is so avoidable, uh, right. both with the social determinants of health and just with this personal accountability responsibility to say, I'm going to take care of myself every day. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to um, figure out those things that I need from the healthcare system and use them. But otherwise I'm on my own. Like I'm, I'm my own doctor in a way, you know, uh, the buck stops with me. So I love that we agree on that. And I uh, really appreciate everything that you were able to share. So thank you again for being on the show. Great talking with you.